Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar devoted to the future of performance engineering. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Giuseppe Nardiello, VP Product Management and Business Development at Acamas. I'll be responsible for hosting this webinar today. Ignite by Acamas is a new series of webinar where we invite recorded experts to discuss performance engineering and optimization uh, topics. I'm glad to introduce today's speakers. Scott Moore, currently Head of Customer Engineering at Tricentis, is a well-known expert, active writer, speaker, influencer, and the host of the online show, The Performance Tour. And I know he's about to get back on the road for the 2022 edition, right, Scott? That's right, and I want to apologize up front for the quality of my voice as I recover from a, a, a nasty cough here, but I'll do my best uh, to speak as loud as I can. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to be doing the performance tour as travel opens back up in the U.S. I'm really excited about that, and thank you for having me. It's really exciting to see this Ignite series kick off and what Akamas is doing with this, and I'm, I'm looking forward. It's, it's kind of a privilege to be one of the first ones to kick it off, but to see uh, some of the upcoming uh, ones that you're going to have is, is great. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, really pleased to have you here. Um, we wish you the best for recovering from your cold. And our other speaker today is my colleague Stefano Doni with CTO at Akamas. Stefano describes himself as obsessed with performance optimization and is the driving force behind Akamas vision for autonomous performance optimization powered by AI. Stefano, uh, please say hi. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today on this first episode. I'm very pleased to be here with Scott today and discuss with all of you about the future of performance engineering. All right, before getting started, let me remind you that a recorded version of the webinar will be available on YouTube channel in the following days. All right, get started. So uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you all for uh, the number of questions, many, many interesting questions we received for this webinar. We selected a number of them and actually we grouped them in three buckets, which will provide us with the three topics of our agenda today. So the three topics are how performance engineering is changing. On this, I'm sure we can leverage Scott expertise. Our second topic is performance testing methodologies and tools. And here I expect both Scott and Stefano to provide their point of view. And finally, we plan to cover optimizing Kubernetes and microservice application. I know Stefano has some interesting insights uh, to share on this topic. Feel free to ask any additional question you may have in the Q&A window. We'll try to answer as many of them as possible. So, Scott, uh, we can read the questions for this first section here. I'll let you and Stefano take the floor. I know we prepared a few slides to support our conversation, so please let me know when you want me to move there. Sure, uh, thank you. And it's really interesting to do a webinar like this where you are answering questions that people actually have instead of just having to, to make up your own agenda here but and these are great questions um so we talk about um performance engineering a lot more today than we did in the past years it was always i'm a performance tester now people are talking more about performance engineering rather than just testing so we have to talk about the skill sets that are now changing over time whereas when we thought about performance testing it was we meet performance requirements. We put a round peg in a round hole. Does it meet the performance requirements? We would only know that after we did a test. When we think about performance engineering, it's about possibly tuning and changing an application for the better even before you ever run a performance test. So the skill sets, although I've, I've, I've been asked this question for years and talked about it for years, uh, all the way back to 2004, uh, I do think the skill sets are changing where as a performance engineer, you have to know more at the code level. You have to understand how uh, automated pipelines work. You have to uh, understand different necessarily, not just uh, web technologies, but microservices. And there's a lot of other things now that are going on where we're changing uh, what we're using to gather metrics. Um, and, and Stefano, uh, do you want to uh, address like, the difference between a performance test or a performance engineer from say five years ago or 10 years ago to today? 
Yeah, sure. I guess you you touched a lot of of great points. So one of the things that uh, I'm also mentioning more about also the optimization part. So actually, performance engineering is always tasked with finding solution to better make application run faster, make the application cost less, or make the application be more resilient. So this is kind of broadening the, the spectrum of the activity that we see included in performance engineering. And of course, that is also being in a way uh, impacted also by the new kind of roles that transition from performance engineering, traditional kind of QA roles into the DevOps kind of movement and also the SCRE kind of roles, which is uh, ties back also to the to the next question, which is uh, very interesting. So again, uh, adopting SRE practices, for example, means uh, also the organization and the roles within the organization are changing. And by the way, I think we have a slide on, on this one. Yeah, in fact, um, Giuseppe, if you would go one more slide beyond that first, um, these links right here I wanted to share because as far back as 2004, I had people asking me questions, uh, how does one become a good performance engineer? What are the things that I need to know? Is it just how to use a tool and run a, a load test? And obviously that was never the answer. So I started talking about that back when the Performance Center of Excellence was the, the big topic of the day. Uh, I had to update that uh, last year in 2020 and, and uh, talk about what are the other things that I would have wanted to know when I first started doing performance engineering and what things can I be studying to get there? Because it's it's not just oh, I've been doing this for a week and then I understand. There's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of things to understand. And then I shared a lot of this with um, with Test Guild, with Joe Colantonio uh, last year as well on his Perf Guild. Um, uh, I guess it was a podcast that he did. So if anybody wants to check any of that out, I go into a lot more detail than we have time for today, but I just wanted to mention that. But that does take us into uh, the next part of this, this second question, which is what, where are we going? What is the future of that? So Giuseppe, if you go back up to the, the big thing, the big elephant in the room is that everything becomes continuous. Uh, do, do you want to address that first, Stefano, or do you want me to just talk? Yeah, about? please go ahead. Go. Yeah, so the, the thing that I see as far as if we talk about the future uh, and where we are today versus over the next, and it's, it's a continuation of where we are. Like there are, are companies that are on the cutting edge right now. Right. And I, I would list, you know, the Googles, the ones who are setting the pace and setting the things that we're going to be doing. And then there are some uh, verticals that are four or five, ten years behind that are still going to be catching up. So we're all kind of shifting towards this. Of course, the last couple of years have kind of forced the digital transformation shift to be even faster. But I see it as continuous, which means continuous feedback, early feedback continuous actions and continuous value from performance. And that means continuous testing, continuous tuning, continuous monitoring. So the word continuous is all in there. I, with continuous means that there are moving parts and things that are more dynamic than they've ever been before. We're gonna be talking a lot about Kubernetes and you, know, you have container-based applications being deployed that are completely dynamic and completely scale up, scale down, change, uh, appear, disappear as needed. Um, so that's something that has to be, that's where we're going. That's where the industry is going. And the techniques that we used in the past don't necessarily translate very well. We have to change some of our strategies. Uh, third thing would be priority. Having uh, performance as part of the culture, which I think DevOps does do, is, is it becomes more of a first class citizen. And then thinking of it in terms of the life cycle from beginning to end. So as we look at this slide now, going back to continuous, um, it's about continuous throughout the entire the entire life cycle. Um, and again, getting that early feedback. Do you want to comment on that too, Stefano? Yeah, sure. I guess you you described it a little, uh, very well, the, the key concept. Uh, I guess I want to also point out uh, one of the things that actually didn't change, which is something that I always like to, to mention to also to to junior performance engineers, which is to have a clear methodology around performance engineering, because actually being able to analyze, uh, I don't know, a monolithic application, being able to analyze uh, uh, a serverless system or even, uh, I don't know, a Kubernetes container actually requires you to have a kind of methodology and not just, in a way, 
trying to find out the, the metrics that your monitoring tools give you and try to, uh, in a way, ident identify bottlenecks by just by what you have. But instead, it's more important to have a clear and solid methodology around performance engineering. So what are the main topics, the main metrics that I should look at? How do I decompose my system? What are my performance engineering goals that I really um, trying to improve? So that, that's kind of, that kind of methodology, I think it's very important because it lets us think clearly about performance and we can really analyze everything and uh, understand better what how the system works with, with some kind of solid background in performance engineering. Right, and the more repeatable that you have it, the less you have to think about what you're doing, you can focus on the results that you're getting, uh, which is really the, the end goal there. And, and then that takes us to the, the last question in this section, which is, uh, have performance engineering and the SRE, site reliability engineer roles, have they been merged? Uh, they seem to be synonymous these days. This is being asked by somebody. Uh, me personally, I feel like there's still a designation between the two um, because according to Google, officially an SRE needs to be spending 50% of their time coding, uh, writing code in code, and 50% of their time in ops. And so I, I call that role sort of the find it, fix it folks. Um, and then from a performance engineering standpoint, I think that's a skill set that looks across that whole life cycle. So very wide spectrum, but a very narrow focus of understanding performance at every level. Maybe code today, it may be infrastructure tomorrow. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think you're 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 right. So I, I guess so Giuseppe, you you could please go to the to the slide exactly. So just for um, to remind the concept. So it's interesting to see how Google itself defined uh, SRE practices and how that is uh, really related to performance engineering. Because if you read actually, the SRE teams really has to manage latency, performance, availability, efficiency, monitoring. Capacity planning, so it's it's a whole plot of performance engineering in there. Of course, I agree with you in the fact that SREs are actually being implemented initially in the, in the organization as uh, as a first way in a kind of uh, ops environments because at the end of the day they are mostly responsible for keeping the system up. So, for example, they they have lots of um, way responsibility around incident response, for example. But in a way, it's interesting also to, um, the fact that SRE are shaping out the QA teams, for example, performance engineering teams are working because, uh, for example, SRE kind of, kind of practice brings more attention to reliability SLOs. So this kind of reliability in the index uh, and the fact that your application, a new release, for example, might match or not, the, the, your SLOs is important. Also in the kind of QA phase, in the pre prod phase uh, as a performance test, uh, um kind of job and also mm, identifying the right test scenarios is important because uh, the way that you have defined your slos for example you may discover the critical user journey for your ser business service what is really important for the business to 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 consider this service as reliable that can inform also the, the test design and so that you can really leverage the the, the the shared infrastructure, the shared information that uh, SRE teams have already built, uh, and in a way being more effective towards, uh, in a way, working in the same direction. Yeah, and think about the skill sets that you have to have and some of the background and context you have to have to be on a really good SRE team. And all of those things listed in this slide about availability, performance, change management, emergency response, I mean, there's a lot to that. Right. And so I see in organizations a place for both of those roles to be there and to work together hand in hand where each one has the, the strengths. And um, I think there's a place for both at the end of it. Thank so, you, Scott and uh, Stefano. Um, I think we got the first section covered. Um, I think we can move to the second topic. And Stefano was mentioning uh, methodologies. Right. So I think this is a very appropriate that we now are dealing with performance testing tools and methodologies. And uh, again, Stefano and, and Scott, please go on uh, with those questions and answers. Sure. Um, so I guess the first two kind of go together where 
uh, question, what tools would you suggest to be used for performance testing? Uh, the one that works for you, that gives you the results that you need. As the, di the director of uh, customer engineering for Tricentis, obviously I'm gonna recommend Neoload, but I wanna, I wanna say this in terms of tools, uh, because this other one, open source tools that can be used for testing and monitoring performance. Obviously there are, are open source tools out there to do all of these things, and there are some good ones. Um, I tend to, in my practice as a consultant for years, I tended to uh, steer towards commercial tools that had more feature sets built into them instead of uh, piecing together multiple tools or say a dozen tools to get what I need, maybe two or three tools, mainly because I had a scope of time where you have to get this work done, you need to get the results so that we can make a business decision and you're very expensive as a consultant, so I need the information now. Uh, so I tended to go towards that because I had everything that I needed. I, I like Neoload for the fact that it's more of a, a low code solution so I can get the, the I would call scripting uh, part done or the automation part done much faster because in my opinion, and Stefano, I wanna hear what you have to say about this, the, of any tool that you use, the value that comes from any performance testing tool is the, the metrics you get, is the analysis that comes out of it. Sometimes uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with something like JMeter plus InfluxDB plus Grafana plus Prometheus plus, so you gotta have, you gotta understand all of those, put them together and then make sense of it. And with that limited amount of them, some people would say, well, that's the fun of it, Scott. Well, it depends on if you're under the gun or not. Um, <laughs> But it's all about getting that analysis and so the business can make a decision. Do we go? Do we not go? Is there a showstopper? How much money is this going to cost us? I mean, you agree? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yes. And in fact, this, if I did, this is actually the real uh, important part. Uh, uh, I, one of the, the other points that I would always uh, like to, to make is that, for example, if you take Grafana, which is actually the, I would say, the most commonly used open source tool for monitoring today. And you go to their website, the out of the box dashboard, for example, for Kubernetes, or even for Linux metrics, Linux OS, most of the time they are not showing the right KPIs, in my, in my opinion, because actually this is actually the hard part. So understanding what do I need to look at in those, and I would say dozens and dozens of metric. Am I looking at, I don't know, CPU usage? I need to look at the saturation. So what are the most important metrics? And surprisingly, they are not, um, maybe not uh, in a way defined correctly out of the box. And that, that's, that's ties back actually to what we were saying before, to have the right methodology, to understand really what you need to, to look at. Why are you looking at a specific metric? Of course, this also depends on, uh, I guess, question number three about the, the most important, more, more relevant metrics that you need to look at. Right, so you have to have a, a good methodology and process in place to uh, and understand your application to understand what those relevant metrics might be. So this is why I really like uh, working with you, Stefano, on, on Akamas, because um, your your product has a library of things that you've learned over time, rule sets that help you tune specific applications, databases, infrastructure, where it does the heavy lifting for you because you've been there, you've done that, you've tested that before. And me going back to, you know, the ancient days where we had to do all of this stuff manually and figure all of it out, it might be a three month engagement in a lab of very small incremental changes, testing over and over and over again. And then, and then coming to find out, uh, having not talked to somebody in the business that some of the KPIs we were monitoring and tuning weren't even things they were interested in. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's great. Yes, thanks for, the, for mentioning our work. And I guess it, it's also related to what we were saying before. So it depends really on the, on the business needs. So why are you doing performance engineering? What are the, the goals? of the performance testing activity, what are the most important KPIs that you want to look at. Also looking, thinking about reliability and site reliability engineering um, kind of shift. So how is the reliability going? So how, how is that impacting your application? And what are the different kind of, uh, in a way, impact that you have on different layers on the infrastructure, for example. So you have these kind of layers that, in a way, on which your application sits and you need to be able to analyze all of them 
with uh, with respect to the relevant metrics uh, that you that you need to analyze so that's that's uh, actually important yes I know um, many of the members of the audience are going to be uh, working with Kubernetes deployed applications. That's why they're attending this this webinar. If we could go to the slide that's right after this, because that, that kind of answers the question about just some examples of some open source tools. We talk about deploying Kubernetes. We're usually talking about observability, not just traditional APM you know, tools, which some of that is useful as well. But here's just some examples of open source either projects um, or deployments here where we've got Prometheus where we get certain SLIs from there. Uh, we get log metrics from FluentD and FluentBit um, and then we have open telemetry and open tracing as well and these are projects that are ongoing and are, are being used and being deployed with these clusters today to, to try to give you more of a 360 degree view and find out not only Here's the haystack with the problem, but here's a needle in the haystack as well. Am, am I leaving anything out or is this, this a traditional, what you might use? I'm asking, because all these are open source, is this something that you see typically? Yeah, sure, Scott. Yeah, I guess you you mentioned yeah, the most common tools. Of course, Prometheus is gonna be the, uh, I would say, has won the, the monitoring war in a sense. Uh, and it's we are seeing it a lot, uh, and also traces is a kind of new, um, kind of new kid in the block. It's very useful to uh, to understand some kind of outliers and understand why a code went slower, and it might be useful in sp under specific uh, circumstances. Yes, so I guess that's that's the key ones. Well, I I know that um, like the the next question down was talking about. Um, automating the performance testing with predefined criteria to meet an SLA. I may be thinking about that a little different than you might be thinking about that. So if we think in terms of SLI, SLO, SLA, SLI being the metric, SLO is what you're shooting for, uh, and I guess an internal style metric, um, SLA being something with a penalty that's a, a, an actual formal contract, which we I very rarely see these days. Uh, but thinking about these SLOs, Whatever product or whatever tools that you're using to test, uh, if, if it has this built-in concept of what it calls an SLA or an SLO, like in NeoLoad, we have the concept of an SLA, which fulfills that SLO as well. Um, that is something that you can set up front, and if it doesn't meet that criteria, um, NeoLoad's output will show you know red lines, warning lines when you when you get near it, and you define what failure is. Uh, depending on what your business requirements are, but you may be thinking in terms of uh, what what Akamas offers as a predefined criteria, right? What, how would that differ with Akamas? Yeah, it's actually um, in a way pretty similar in the sense that we in, in the in optimization driven by Akamas, you may set your goal. So, for example, I want to um, reduce my response time by optimizing Kubernetes container sizing, or for example, the JVM flags, uh, and that. Uh, and let AI, in a way, find out the best configuration to for your specific goal. For example, reducing the response time. We see actually we have the capability uh, and have added the capability to the, our product to support co what we call constraints. So you will be able to say, okay, I want to, for example, reduce my response time, but I don't want to consume more of this amount of resources, of course. Or the other way around, I want to reduce my bill, my cloud bill, but I don't want to make my application run slower. And again, these kind of constraints, which can actually uh, be can implement the SLO kind of concept, are, are actually also used by the machine learning to understand if a given optimization, if a given configuration is good or not. It might be good, for example, in reducing the total amount of bid that I'm getting from my cloud provider, but it may fail my SLOs. So this kind of soft failure, that we can call it like that, it's it's important. It's it's being taken into consideration by the machine learning optimizer in order to provide you the you know, the best possible configuration that in a way fulfills the goal, but at the same time matches your SLOs, uh, which at the end of the day is what uh, you're, you you care about. Awesome. So let's let's move right along. Uh, the next question is how do we set performance testing benchmarks for a new product? Now, this is something I've had to come across you know, many times over the years because 
you know, hey, we've never done this before. This is the this is version 1.0. Whether it's our first packaged application, uh, maybe that's our first SAP rollout, and it's not vanilla. It's heavily customized, or uh, it's something we built internally. You know, how do you figure out how to set those benchmarks? Well, I mean, defining benchmarks would be would be one thing, but just in terms of what you, what you're going to achieve as out an outcome of this application. It, to me, it starts with, like if I walk in as a consultant, I'm not even part of that company. I have to figure out this application pretty quick. So I got to talk to a lot of people. But if I want to find out where I start is I start with the business and I say, why did you write this app? What's the purpose of putting this application out? What are you hoping to achieve with this? And if, if certain things fail, you're all going to be out of a job. Nobody's going to get paid. You follow the money. You know, You find out those things. And then you begin to start looking at those use cases and then you start building volumes from there. Is that is that how you've traditionally done it in the past? Yeah, sure. We our experience, I would say, match what you have described. So always start with it with the business goal. And again, this also relates to the SLIs and SLOs of SREs. So what are the critical user journey that you wanna make sure that you wanna measure as a as a way to really measure the reliability of the application? And that also can inform the way that you can, you know, we design your test scripts in pre-prod. So that's that's also something that doesn't change also with SREs, and it's an opportunity to, to be more aligned also in the in the new kind of reliability practices. And but it's something that performance engineers have always done since a long time. Mm -hmm. If it's a web-based application, there are things that you can use if you've never done it before and you're just um, running you know, this for the first time or you're, you're, you're learning as you go. Some of the things I always point to uh, just out of the gate, I always like to mention Google Rail. If you, go, uh, if you actually do a search on Google R-A-I-L, you'll see that it, it basically means there are certain timings that are kind of expected in the industry today, at least from Google's definition. And it pretty much means that any microservice or um, API call should come back within about 100 milliseconds. And then every full web page that's rendered should come back in about five seconds. Now, there's going to be exceptions to that depending on what your business requirements are. Uh, but that's a good starting point to me. And then you can you can address that and change it as you will. And the second piece would be creating some kind of a performance budget, not a financial budget, but in other words, how much can you actually fit into a page request, a uh, service request, uh, a, a rendered page, because you can only fit so much in that before it, it starts degrading or you start running out of resources, for example. So if you think about that up front, uh, we have to put together a budget that meets this criteria and we have this SLO that we have to meet, which may be based on Google Rail, you at least have a good starting point and then you can you can go from there. Do you have other things that you typically recommend to say, here's a here's something you can start with? Yeah, I guess the, your point about the web application was was a good one. In general, I think it's the, the general recommendation was to to tie back to the to the actual goal because that's for example in the benchmarking space, we have lots and lots of benchmarks. We have micro benchmarks, we have application level benchmarks in the industry. And sometimes people try to use this kind of benchmarks, for example, I was reading just today an interesting announcement from Google Cloud. They have, you know, we released a new type of virtual machines that is pro, um, pro, very promising in that it, it has a very good price performance ratio. So it can deliver high performance at low cost. And they were comparing this, this benchmarking magazine was comparing the performance against another kind of instance by AWS. Again, that they were doing this kind of comparison using benchmarks that are actually the easiest way because you have lots and lots of open source application that you can use for example a postgres application or a java application but in the end of the day they may be very different with respect to your actual application so the kind of those kind of results are interesting but you it's always better to in a way test your actual application and see how, how it, it behaves because we have seen in, in my experience i've seen some interesting surprises where for example new server a new instance was uh, in a way had a pretty dramatic performance improvement, but once we tested with a particular customer application, we didn't get any any benefit out of it. That might depend on several factors. Even the architecture of the application, perhaps they might not 
in a way be designed to fully leverage some kind of CPU features or something like that. So those are ways that you can use, but actually the best, um, the best suggestion that I guess I can give is always uh, try to use your actual application and measuring the actual KPIs that can, you care about. And this actually is a great tie into this last question on this section, which I, I really like this question, and I'm going to let you answer more of it than me because I know you have a lot of thoughts on this. Which, which is more important to tune first, the application layer or the code or the infrastructure layer? So if I'm if I think in terms of the traditional pipeline where you've got code checked in on the left hand side, but the environment is nowhere near production. I'm not expecting the SLO to necessarily be met there for every feature or every request. I'm looking for patterns at that point. I want the feedback, but I'm looking for patterns of things that are much higher or use more resources than others and try to fix them there versus we, we continue to shift towards the right where we have a production-like environment. And at that point, the, the infrastructure should be doing what it, it needs to do. Hopefully, we've tuned the code to the point where it's, it's most efficient and then we can begin to work on the infrastructure. Do you agree, agree with that or can you do both at the same time? Or Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the, the way that uh, um, that I see in, in done in practice is actually what how you describe. So most of the teams that are doing performance tuning today simply focus on the code. So because it's easier, so you have those profilers which are built in into APN tools, for example, that gives you this kind of information readily available. So where are you spending most of the time in the code? Where you are, are you spending most of the CPU resources, et cetera? Uh, that, that, that works, of course, but I see it as being in a way um, less efficient in that you need to, of course, involve development teams, which are typically very busy and uh, doing uh, uh, some business critical new features, et cetera. And what is less, um, in a way, um, optimized today is the level of configuration that you have in the IT stacks. And so, for example, think about the sizing of the containers, the JVM options, even the application and the frameworks like Tomcat itself, or the, uh, the, the cloud instances, for example, that we were mentioning before, all of those layers have literally dozens of configuration options that you can tune. Of course, that, that's very hard for, performance engineers because actually you have uh, it's it's something that you have to change one thing at a time and do a performance test and see, uh, and see if things improved or made the application worse and start over and uh, so it's very hard but on the same time it's an area where we really have some kind of hidden gems we could say because simply because nobody is doing that due to the complexity you are everybody is running with kind of default options pretty much across the stack and that's, that's uh, of course, uh, I'm also biased here, but that's what we are doing with Akamas by using machine learning and being able to extract all this kind of, to actually learn how to optimize automatically all these kind of parameters really can give some very important performance improvements or reliability improvements or cost improvements virtually for free because free in the sense that you don't need to actually spend uh, weeks and months of time doing experiments or actually fixing the code, which still, of course, remains an important practice because at the end of the day, the code is also always um, always matter. But I guess we we should not forget the fact that we have lots and lots of other possibilities that can be done at the same time. Excellent. Thank so you, I Stefano and Scott, for um, providing your insights. I think we already started touching on some of the topics for the third section. And I know there was a question uh, regarding to Kubernetes and whether performance testing is easier for microservice-based application with respect to monolithic application. Maybe we, we, we should also tackle this question now um, before moving uh, to the third uh, section, uh, which is more about optimizing uh, those applications. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I was actually going to ask you to go to that slide first anyway. Um, so in my opinion, I mean, we used to call that back in, you know, 10 years ago, componentized applications, right? But now it's microservices, which may be on the same cloud, on a different cloud, a third-party provider, et cetera. So for me, the key word here that's not on this slide is the complexity level of putting this thing together 
being able to understand what each what each microservice provides in the way of efficiency and performance, resiliency, and then the thing together, right, being put together. So to me, that says complex, which means not less testing, but a lot more testing. So in my opinion, it's not necessarily more difficult to do. It just takes a lot of work because there's a lot more testing that should be done. Would you agree, Stefano? Yeah, sure. Again, on, I think on, on one side, the microservices make things easier because simply because of the, due to the fact that they are typically associated with containers. So the beauty of Docker and con other containers runtimes is that you can, of course, run it whatever, wherever you want. So from the laptop of the developer up to your data center or the or the or the cloud itself. So that is actually very uh, handy and uh, lets you actually do much more testing in a kind of more representative way with respect to production. And the other thing is that, of course, uh, traditionally uh, monolithic applications are hard to understand, hard to measure, hard, hard to observe. While microservices have those well-defined interfaces like APIs, etc., that lets you also work easier on, a, on, for example, reproducing the current workload. But on the, actually, the downside that you mentioned are actually what, where we see people are performance engineering teams are struggling today. So we went from the monolithic where you could actually do a very good performance analysis, understand your uh, operating system metrics, understand your middleware ma metrics like the GVM, understand your application metrics, business level metrics, response time, throughput, etc. Now we went from to a world where we have literally dozens of moving parts. It's not Mm, it's not uncommon to have really 50 or even 200 microservices that are actually at the same uh, interacting among themselves and realizing a single higher level business service like I don't know a banking banking account service or something like that so we went from analyzing I don't know 50 metrics from a monolithic to do to analyzing I don't know 50 metrics times the number of microservices so this this becomes a challenge if you to un simply understand what sh sh shall I tune where should I focus my tuning efforts? And here I see also uh, uh, monitoring tools. Uh, actually, I don't think they are actually helping a lot performance engineers on that regard because I think they are geared more towards actually identifying issues in production. But when we are working in pre-production environments, I need to find out, for example, how can I save my resources? How can I, you know, for example, right-size my containers? It's, it's really up to the performance engineer today you have to understand all the metrics, you have to understand where you have left capacity that is not being used and do these kind of exercises that are very, very time consuming. So that's that's the, the issues that we, we see. And also you have additional kind of variables to consider. So for example, the, the sizing of the pods in Kubernetes, something that probably you didn't had to, to consider before because your VMs were fixed in some way. So you didn't have to decide that it was already uh, a taken decision. Now you can also decide the size of the consider, container. You have to decide the auto scanning settings, etc. So it's a whole lot of stuff that it's on the it's on in a way it's a, it's a part of the task of a performance engineer. And, and with so many metrics, so many more metrics now, you know you get barraged with so much data that somebody eventually has to look at and make sense of it. And a lot of the conversations I've been having with performance engineers is like, well, we can gather every kind of piece of data you can imagine, but if we're not going to do anything with it, why are, why are we gathering it? So it, it's about gathering the right information and being able to do something about the information that you're given. So I think people need to think about that. Otherwise, they're just going to get drowned in all of these metrics and data. And this is where you know, some, something that is more of a learning type feature uh, for Agamas to help us figure that out as well is, is pretty powerful, I would say. Yes, yes, actually, that's that's one of the main use cases that we see at the moment, the whole microservices kind of sizing and tuning the, the, at the infrastructure level and the runtime level. It's really becoming really hard and it's become really necessary on, on the other side because all those kind of parameters really, really impact the application reliability, the cost of, of running Kubernetes application pretty directly because the, the numbers that the, the developers put into the YAML files of Kubernetes pods are at the end of the day driving up the, the cloud bills 
and it's a, it's becoming more and more important also for the business to being able to drive processes to on the right side the infrastructure um, and also maintain the reliability that that is expected. Right. I think this is a great segue for the our third section, which was uh, about optimizing Kubernetes and microservice applications. Um, there's a one question which I believe uh, has already been addressed, but if you want to go get over it again, uh, otherwise feel free to go directly to the following ones. No, I, I think I think we did a good job on that one, as Stefano did. Um, go this first question here about optimizing code configuration, the most popular fix. And I have a question for you about uh, Stefano about this because let's go back to. Uh, mid late 90s early 2000s right you you've been involved with capacity planning forever you've done load tests forever and I have to when we were all focused more on back end this is before Steve Souders and and yeah. java a script became so heavy on the front end we were always concerned about the back end when we did a performance test and what was that key component we always saw that was the problem the database and and for me that typical fix was if you had a really good DBA on staff, maybe you found out that the lead developer did all the database work himself and never contacted the DBA for any help in architecting the database and they did a oopsie or something. We would we would run this test and everybody would be running it and then the DBA would look at this and go, what's going on? They would turn on some kind of a profiler or something and you'd hear them go, um, stop stop because we, we would all be on the call together monitor and they would be stop the test and then you'd hear keyboard clicking click 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 <laughs> run it again and like half the problems would go away right it was like 60 percent of the stuff i saw was low-hanging fruit from the database missing index something of that nature and then we we would move on and everything else it was that ringing of that last 10 percent out of the application Let's fast forward to today. What do you see as that most popular fix now? Is it we haven't set auto scaling right? We don't know when it's supposed to kick on. I mean, what what are we seeing? Yeah, yeah that, that, thanks for the great question. Actually, uh, what we see, especially as regards microservice and Kubernetes application, really the in a way the microservices, the uh, the application logic is where most of the time the bottleneck is. So the fact that you have those uh, high number of microservices all interacting among themselves means that it might, it's becoming very, very important to properly size them. So for each microservice, you have to decide in Kubernetes uh, your CPU and memory requests and limits, which dictates how many, how many resources are being assigned to the container and what's the actual cap, the actual limit. And you need to do that for, for each single microservice. When, if, you, if that kind of sizing is not done properly, you will end up risking uh, lots of performance and viability and also reliability issues. Because one of the things is that it's very easy when uh, um, that's one of the different with, uh, with monolithic applications. When you have a microservice, for example, your front end that interacts with, I don't know, dozens of other microservices, which in turn scores dozens of other microservices, it's actually very important to to care about not just the average for example latency but also to care about the high percentage what they what is called as the tail latency because it, it, it's just a matter of one microservice is slowing down a little bit that your entire higher level request may slow down pretty significantly because you also may have kind of multiplicative effects so the fact that only microservices have stable performance even in the tail latency like p95 or p99 it's very important to have the higher level predictable performance. And those actually, that, that kind of stability and efficiency ties back also to the to how do you properly tune the, the containers as you got the Kubernetes resources, but also the runtimes can play a, a significant role. It's in, in like, like we, we have always done tuning the JVM, for example. This is becoming uh, even more important because with containers, you typically have much more smaller amount of memory, for example. So some kind of actions are very interesting there to make the performance of the application more stable, et cetera. Great. Uh, I, I have been dominating the conversation here up to this point. I'm going to let you address the, the last two questions in this section while I take a quick yeah. break. Yeah, OK. So I guess what the recommended approach to resizing Kubernetes spots is uh, um, is actually I, I, we have a couple of slides on that regard. I think we are pretty 
uh, also running out of time I just want to mention a couple of them because of course it, Kubernetes brings a lot of benefits for application developers and uh, operational staff in terms of ensuring reliability of the application, ensuring efficient scheduling, etc. But all of that, in a way, benefits relies on the application teams being able to properly configure the applications. So one of the pro key properties is what are called resource requests, which actually uh, drives to uh, relates to the amount of resources that are actually guaranteed to, for your container. And uh, the impact of those this kind of parameters is pretty important because actually new, this impacts the cost of your application because Kubernetes basically needs to allocate and reserve the CPU and memory resources on the cluster, on the actual infrastructure level, based on what the developer really put on, the, on those kind of YAML files. So that's one side of the, of the coin. The other thing is related to uh, resource requests, uh, resource limits, pardon, which uh, actually is uh, the next slide, which are more uh, related to, in a way, the maximum amount of resources that a container can get, because the container can consume more resources with respect to what you had requested. So those are important because when you go, you try to go past those kind of limits, uh, some kind of important things can happen. So for example, your container may be slowed down because you have this kind of phenomenon called CPU throttling. If you try to use more CPUs than what you have, uh, um, what your limits are. But in the case of memory, uh, if you try to go past, your container will be killed. So you will have these kind of challenges to ensure low cost, setting proper requests, and also high performance, not try to, to have the good limits, and also not suffer uh, reliability issues due to out of memory keys. So the, the process that I see being used is actually. A pretty much a kind of manual process again related to setting those kind of CPU and memory requests and limits in pre-production environments. So people actually try to reproduce load testing in load testing environments. Uh, the most important user uh, journeys that are measured in, in production, for example, by APN tools, and they try to, in a way, try to manually feed with the parameters and make make sure that they, uh, in a way, they they can match the performance requirements. Again, that that's very, very hard because it's one of the areas where teams are struggling, again, because you have dozens and dozens of microservices. And it's not clear, even using um, current tools for monitoring tools, uh, when you need to adjust them by how much, so I, I, how much memory, additional memory should, should I assign to those containers, or perhaps how, can, how much memory can I, in a way, reduce with this container without any kind of performance penalty. So you have to analyze lots and lots of metrics that's the current practice. I, I, I won't say it's a best practice because actually you have lots of uh, manual work to do. And that's where uh, I think machine learning can really help. We have done lots of um, uh, conferences lately describing how machine learning can really attack this kind of problem by automatically coming up with the best configuration for the pods for a given higher, higher level performance requirements or reliability goal that you may have on the higher level application. So you can express what is your SLO, for example, that you want to improve, and the machine learning can uh, actually optimize all of those container parameters that are hard to reason about in, a, in an automated way for you. So that's, uh, that's the, one of the, the, the key challenges that we see at the moment on Kubernetes, and that's how we think uh, it should be best addressed. Thank you, Stefano and Scott. I'm pleased we got all the question answers. I know you guys could be talking for hours and hours. Um, uh, we we will need to wrap up. There's a, probably just a one question which I'm reading right now, which is about if you can share references and links to best practices for microservice in Kubernetes performance testing. Uh, I think we may provide some uh, additional links, uh, integrate the deck before uh, uh, making it uh, available to anyone who has attended. For now, I, I think we should be closing. And before closing uh, this webinar, let me thank you all for attending and remind you that we also hosting another Ignite by Akamas webinar on November the 24th, again with Stefano and Enric Rexit, cloud native advocate at Dynatrace. Uh, this is fully de devoted to Kubernetes observability and optimization with Akamas and Dynatrace. 
So I uh, hope you can attend. Uh, thank you again and looking forward for having you again with us. Thank you again to everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.